how exciting is this? The last session of the Power Summit. It's in fact the last session for me working at Euroelectric at the Power Summit. So it's a little bit bittersweet for me to be here presenting, but for me, the session today, the topic on 24-7 is one of my true passions. And we at Euroelectric have been really leading the charge in trying to accelerate hourly matching of energy consumption with clean and renewable production. Before I start, I just want to get a sense of who's in the room. So if you could raise your hands, I'm going to ask three questions. First of all, your level of knowledge of 24-7. So who in the room would count themselves as a beginner? Great. We're going to raise your awareness. We're going to educate you, hopefully. What about the middle group who knows something, but not a lot? OK, that's another third. So there's probably a third who think they're experts. Who thinks they're experts? There's a bunch here, I know. OK, that's a small group. This session is not for you. <laughs> I'm going to walk you through a couple of slides over the next 10 minutes to explain the what, why, who, how of 24-7. For those who don't know, it's going to be educational. For those who do, you've seen it many times. Yeah? In fact, there's several of your slides that are in here. First of all, on Euroelectric's actions within this space. So we have, for the last two years, organized a business hub. So it's a platform around 24-7, connecting buyers and suppliers and third-party solution providers. We do it in connection with Resource, with RE100, with Energy Tag, and Flexidow, and many others. The ecosystem within that space is divided into four pillars. First of all, about raising awareness and educating both corporate buyers, policymakers, and so on. Adv advocacy, so influencing policymakers to make sure that the right regulatory framework is in place. The third is technical training for those corporates who are then interested in going down this journey. And finally, most importantly, but possibly most difficult, is the implementation piece. And there we're developing some uh, template contracts, some B2B meetings, some toolkits that people can then use. So what is it? Well, this hourly matching, and you'll hear this several times during the session, is a journey. We're not advocating 100% 24-7 immediately. First of all, it's unrealistic, it's expensive. And what we're saying is that you can do this hourly matching in parallel to your current annual matching. It doesn't undermine or change in any way. In fact, as a corporate off-taker, if you got your carbon-free energy score, you would already be on that journey towards 100%. So this is what annual matching looks like. This is a typical data center with the renewable supply and the demand. And what you see is the renewable supply fills in the gaps, which is basically the grid offtake. So depending which jurisdiction you're in and the carbon intensity of the grid, you're actually, you are using carbon intense supply. And that's why when you shift to hourly matching, and this is a snapshot from Peninsula Clean Energy, it's a utility in California, and they aim to supply by 2025, 100% of their clients with 100% hourly matched renewables. Super ambitious, but they think it's achievable. And as you see, when you move from the top to the bottom, from annual to hourly, you actually fill in the gaps. Now, that requires storage, some clean firm, and some advanced digital technologies, but it can be done. And they're really one of the first utilities in the world who've shown this is going to happen from a supply side. Why? Now, why would you move in this direction? I've listed five benefits here, and it's not us saying this. This is reputable, academic, and institutional organizations who've done modeling this space. The five are eliminating fossil fuel reliance. You've just seen the previous graph about how moving towards hourly can actually not just reduce, but completely eliminate carbon emissions. The second is about price hedging, and we're going to go into some details on that uh, with the panel, so I won't go into more details there, but that is a thing. The third is about accelerating storage. 
and flexibility. So it actually incentivizes new technologies to come on to allow this hourly matching. The fourth is system signals, and especially to system operators, about bringing on renewable energy at the right place and the right time. And finally, about accurate accounting. So there is the greenhouse gas protocol review now going on, and there's an opportunity to increase the accuracy of carbon accounting through that protocol using hourly matching. I'm going to show four very quick slides of the models, but please do find them on our website. The full reports are there. You can find extensive details. But I'm going to run through those four, the four of the benefits now on the screen. So the first one is from Long Duration Energy Storage Council and McKinsey study. This is about carbon emissions, and it's always the annual matching and the grid on the left moving towards 100% hourly matching on the right. And as you see, from the grid average moving towards annual solar, you already reduce 40 to 50% of your emissions. That's 100% annual match solar. 100% wind matched solar is 60 to 70%. Of course, if you then move to 100% hourly matched, then it's zero, zero emissions. Same content, different graph, different institution. This is Princeton University. And what you see there again on the left is the annual matching moving steadily towards 100% hourly matching, reducing to zero the emissions. Now on the economics, so this is a study by Technical University of Berlin, where they did some modeling of various different countries in Europe. And as you see again, the annual matching on the left, and as you move towards 80, 85, progressively towards 100%, the economics change. But already at 85, 90%, it's cost comparable to 100% annual matching. However, it does reduce emissions significantly. As you move towards 100% hourly matching, the cost increases significantly because of those new technologies that you need to fill those gaps. Now onto the IEA, did some modeling of, I believe it's India and Indonesia, yeah, by 2030. And they saw system benefits. So in fact, as you move from annual, the orange circle, towards hourly, 100% matched, there's twice as much system benefits in terms of US dollars per megawatt hour. So that's the economic benefits for the whole electricity system. So now onto the drivers. We see two significant forcing functions that are now coming into play. First of all, on ESG. So corporates are now being pressured and are becoming aware of the sense that they need to do more not just on ESG generally, but specifically on energy procurement and carbon emission removal. These are some examples of some newspaper articles highlighting that fact, but we're seeing now a move, strong move from NGOs and corporates towards high-impact corporate sourcing. The second forcing function, and this is critical, especially now in Europe, I believe just uh, yesterday, the Delegated Act for Renew Renewable Hydrogen was published, so that now makes the criteria for renewable hydrogen specific requirement for hourly matching. So any investment in hydrogen electrolyzers in Europe now, they'd have to take into consideration the future hourly matching. This is also being discussed in the US now, and in a couple of weeks they'll make an announcement. We'll see how that goes. In addition, the US government has made a commitment to source 50% of their power hourly matched in the future. So you see it heading in that direction. We now see it as inevitable that this will happen. So how fast and how far this will go, that's the question. Who's doing it? Well, within our community, that's the hub at Euroelectric, we have over 200 companies now uh, in that membership. Buyers, suppliers, third-party solution providers. You see some huge names there. In terms of deals, well, it's still early stage, let's be honest but it's moving and it's moving fast. So what we understand is that many of those corporates who are not on this list are now discussing, okay, how can we do this? What products are available? Finally, and I'll end with this slide, is what does the global situation look like? So as many of you know, I'm, I'm moving in two weeks to this new organization, the Global Renewables Alliance. And there, together with Sustainable Energy for All, we'll be coordinating a global coalition of actors in this space. 
So we'll be working with Euroelectric, obviously closely on the European scene, but also with Asian and US counterparts to drive this initiative forward globally. I'm going to stop there, and we're going to dive into the how. How is this done? And the first speaker is Caroline Golan, the head of global energy at Google, to do a keynote speech. Caroline, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Hello, everyone. Thank you for staying. I appreciate that greatly. Um, so last year, I was on this stage, and I spoke to many of you to try to educate you on what 24-7 CFE was and hopefully inspire many of you to join that movement. Well, we've seen a lot happen in the past year. We've seen cities across Europe launch 24-7 pilots. Just recently, Mayor Khan of London called on all global leaders to commit to local hourly decarbonization. We've seen NGOs and countries and businesses globally sign the 24-7 compact, showing that there is demand and understanding and enthusiasm about this concept. I think we're 120 plus now. We've seen industrial players, like my good friends at Nucor Steel, who traditionally were agnostic to the environmental footprint of their energy use, decide to invest and invest boldly in decarbonization, proving that actors without a 24-7 sustainability goal still see the value in 24-7 products. We've also seen an energy crisis, felt most acutely here, but I think globally has refocused and reshaped the conversation about this dual challenge we have to meet the climate crisis and spur economic development, right? We've also seen unprecedented legislation in the US and in Europe to invest in clean energy technologies and specifically to invest in the decarbonization of our industrial footprint. So this past year has been amazing, a whirlwind. It's taught me a lot of lessons. But I think the most salient lesson and the most relevant one for this conversation is that 24-7 carbon-free energy is not just a sustainability goal, but it's the framework by which our society and our energy ecosystem must continue to operate. So the co-investment of clean power here and abroad is a co-investment in industrial competitiveness and the foundation by which we will drive economic development. I have said it before and I will say it again, a product made on a clean grid is a far more competitive product than one made on a dirty one. So when Google made its commitment to 24-7 CFE, we knew from the start that the road was going to look very different. The tools which had brought us to meeting our 100% renewable energy goal, well, they weren't gonna get us there. The tools, the products, the policies, the partnerships to fully decarbonize the grid, they just didn't exist. And that's the journey we've been on for the past three years. And that's the journey we will continue to pursue. And over the next year, I think you'll see us lean much heavily, much more heavily into the concept of developing the products and the markets that we need for 24-7. Products like new PPA structures that deliver firm, clean energy therefore providing more industrial competitiveness and a hedge against what has become a volatile energy market. Products that provide benefits to our low-income communities who I would argue now more than ever need to be empowered towards, towards their contribution in clean energy and meeting the climate crisis. And products that invite new players to invest in decarbonization, new clean technologies, next generation technologies, and the infrastructure that we all need to get there. And finally, products that create the flexibility that I think we've all talked about for the past couple of days is so critical in this grid and grids globally. But all of this is going to take innovation and it's going to take alignment and multiple stakeholders, you and many, many more. That's why I'm very thankful for the partnership that we forged with Euroelectric and the partnership of my fellow panelists and the hard work of my team, the A-plus experts over here in 24-7. This is the challenge 
of our generation, but it is also the opportunity of our economy. And I feel very privileged to be here, and I feel very privileged to work for a company, Google, that is willing to lead and lead boldly. So thank you for being here, thank you for being part of the conversation, and please ask tough questions. Thanks so much, Caroline, and thanks a lot for your support of your electric. Really appreciate it. So we're going to do a quick poll. Um, the Slido will be on screen again. Whilst I'm doing that, Caroline spoke about new technology, new products, new players, and new rules. Well, the panel we have for you today exemplify that. They're really some of the world's leading players and actors in 24-7. I'm going to introduce him to the stage. Please hold your applause to the end. So Fergal Ahern from SSE, please join us. Julia Selda from Long Duration Energy Storage. John Dallimore from Pexa Park. Vivek Bandari from Power Ledger. And Irina Lazzarini from SE for All. So the poll uh, should be on your phones. If you could get the slider on screen please, the first one. Now, you've heard my pitch about 24-7. You've also heard Caroline, yeah? And the first question is, what do you think? Will 24-7 be relevant in the future? We've put a time frame there, 2025 to 2035. So what do you think? Will it be very relevant, neutral, or not relevant at all? Have we persuaded you that this could be a thing? I'm not going to ask the panel, because I assume they... they <laughs> okay. Let's see the, see the results. Okay. Um, we should have done it before we spoke to see. And I want to know who the not relevant 5% is. We'll single you out and target you later. But seriously, let's dive into the debate. The supply side is critical to this. You've heard the, the buy side. So first to you, Fergal, from SSE. First of all, describe why you think 24-7 is a thing and also what SSE is doing in that space. So firstly, our customers have made very ambitious targets around becoming net zero. Time-matched granular accounting and 24-7 CFE is a key step on that journey. So one, we're, we're listening to our customers. Two, we are also um, signatory to the UN 24-7 CF, CFE uh, compact. And we're also running a number of pilots as well with our customers, one in Ireland and one in GB. They're proof of concept pilots looking at how we can provide our customers with transparency based upon the assets we're providing them with um, on a time match basis so they understand just how they score on a 24-7 basis. The other side of it as well is that we're also actively working with our customers as well. You know, there are challenges with this, Bruce. You touched on it earlier. It's, it's a journey. The, the end state is 100% is 24-7, but there are challenges. For example, in Ireland, we've got one clear res technology in onshore wind. The challenge is how do you meet the rest of the demand? So we're collaborating with our customers, you know, having an open mind in terms of collaborating with third parties to solve those challenges. Perfect, thanks. Before we come on to the two technologies that are linked to that sort of storage and digital, Irina, I just want to come to you because Fergal mentioned the UN Compact. I mean, you're leading on that at SE for All. Tell us a bit about that and what you're doing. Thank you, Bruce. Yes, uh, as you were saying, the 24-7 Carbon Free Energy Compact has been launched in 2021, exactly uh, following up on what Caroline was saying. So the need to globalize the 24-7 Carbon Free Energy movement, but also the need to link it together with the climate crisis. Because as we know, if you tackle the emission from the power sector, we are actually tackling three-fourths of the global carbon emission. And this is why the UN recognized the importance back in 2021 to have a specific energy compact, which is a collection uh, of a collective action of international actors, companies, but also regional and national governments and many more stakeholders 
that want to make 24-7 carbon-free energy a reality for everyone and everywhere. And the main characteristic of the compact is that it's global. So we have now uh, a basis of signatories of 121 uh, in the whole energy ecosystem. So we have energy suppliers, buyers, system operators, but also, as I said, cities, national, regional governments, associations, and academia as well. And it's um, a compact that is covered in different geographies. So it's amazing to see how many new business models 24-7 related are emerging across the globe, uh, in Asia Pacific, in Australia, in Latin America, in Africa, and beyond, uh, let's say, only Europe and uh, North America. So the purpose is to make this a reality for everyone and making sure that all the new elements and business models are shared and this knowledge is shared among all the members of the group. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Super exciting. I mean, to see it, first of all, global, but also the private sector, corporate off-takers, but also the public, so cities and even countries going in that direction. We're going to dive into the technologies now. First of all, with storage to you, Julia. So long-duration energy storage is really the holy grail. The, you know, we need that to scale renewables generally, but especially for hourly matching. Tell us something about your organization and the importance of storage within this concept. Thank you, Bruce. It's great to be with all of you and to be part of the partnership on stage because we truly are the holy grail to make this work with all of the partners to get that 24-7 clean energy. And so the Long Duration Energy Storage Council came together and launched our first report at COP26 showing that this $4 trillion market is really needed to make sure that we have wind and solar all the time. What we also realized that we needed tools for the implementation to reach the market. And so our members, which are technology providers of the four families of long duration energy storage, technical, mechanical, electrochemical, and chemical, but also the ecosystem. So the customers, the manufacturers, the developers, all working together to promote long duration. And the tool that we wanted to really build and promote is the 24 seven clean PPA. Take something in existence and make it better and really make it something that can inspire change as we all work together to meet our net zero targets. In the graph that Bruce showed, you know, we really wanted to show that right now, today, when you wanna have 24 seven clean power, there are still hours of the day that are met with fossil fuel. But what's great news is that you can replace that also today with long duration energy storage. So that truly every hour of every day, of every month, of every year is met with long duration energy storage. That's really powerful, and this tool helps you get there. And that's what we're really proud to see is that working on this granularity, this transparency, this partnership to really make sure we have less curtailment, more savings, more emissions reductions is something we're working again in partnership. So we're thrilled to be part of the organization, part of the Global Renewables Alliance to push around the world how important this tool is. And working with India around the clock, we might call it different things, but the same message is there. We have to transition, we need 24 seven clean energy to do it, and long duration energy storage is an essential tool to make this happen. Yeah, that's great, and what I forgot to mention when I introduced Julia is actually she's the chair, the inaugural founding chair of the Global Renewables Alliance, and there is a good reason for that, is that storage will play a key role in scaling renewables going forward. So thanks a lot for your support. We're gonna move on to the, the, the digital tech in a second, but do prepare your questions. I'm gonna to come to the audience. So please get that ready, there'll be a microphone. So Vivek from Power Ledger, please tell us you know, a bit about your organization, what you're doing, and especially in the digital space, I mean, how can that facilitate this movement? Sure, thank, thank you, Bruce. We, uh, uh, I represent Power Ledger. We are on a mission to democratize the use of power. So democratizing the use of power is when you and I can share power, share energy. And in doing so, what we realized is the electron that is being said not only has a physical side, it also has a social side. It has, it has attributes of location and time. And we started with creating visualization for traceability and we developed digital solutions using blockchain where you can trace the electron, you can trace where it's coming from, where was it generated, uh, is it, was it my neighbor, was it you know, somewhere across 5,000 miles and 80% of it was lost in the way, uh, where is it coming from? So we create technology 
with the fundamental basic layer being traceability, and on top of that, for 24-7, we build solutions, and solutions for trading. Uh, trading energy from a low-income household to uh, another household. Making solar accessible to a low-income household. It could be that a shared battery, that is a storage that is being shared. It could be trading of the environmental attribute certificates. So we provide the digital solution for tracing, tracking, and spin up marketplaces on top to enable 24 seven and provide a, a software solution that is modular. I refer to one of the presentations from yesterday. The solutions uh, software should be modular, be flexible, adaptable to the local environment, be able to fit with uh, the local needs with the other software systems that are in the ecosystem. So that's that's what we do. And again, in a mission to democratize the use of power 24-7 just comes along the way. Yeah. Many of the the, the pushback we get from, from some corporates is they say it's complicated. Uh, this can't be done or, you know, what, what's your answer to that? I mean, I'm assuming you, you've got some solutions that at least to take those first steps to assess where they are and what generally could take is relatively easy. Yeah, so the way uh, we, we have approached with the corporates uh, and in, in general uh, is try it out. Before you say no, try it out. Maybe try a small pilot. Maybe even start with a desktop study. And, and once you see that results, then make an informed decision. Don't try to swallow more than what your throat can ingest, right? So take in a bite size, do, a desktop study, then maybe do another pilot. Maybe it'll take a little bit longer than tra like a traditional thing that is already out there. It's different than voltage regulation as an example, right? So it's already robust. It's been there for the last 60, 70 years, so there's nothing to be piloted. But for these kind of solutions, taking it one step at a time and resolving and going through that hump and showcasing others by thought leaders and act leadership, and that's the way where others would start following you. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, as we showed you, some deals are being done, some commitments are being made, but behind the scenes, there's a lot of activity. Not necessarily corporates making you know, public commitments, but that research, that first steps are being taken. Yeah. So on the intro round, last but not least to, to you, John. So Pexa Park is one of the lead, leading advisory firms on PPAs. First question to you is about where are we in PPA development? You know, what's the European but global scene in terms of CPPAs, in terms of markets, volumes? And if you could, a bit of a crystal ball into the future as well. Sure, bless you. <coughs> Thank you. Well, I think 2022 was notable for many, many reasons. But I think from a PPA geek like myself, one thing that I noticed and it was observed by the public available uh, PPA data was just how active corporate were in securing their PPAs and indeed during 2022 about 80 percent of deals closed were done by corporate and industrials uh, and for the first time taking over from the traditional role of uh, utilities uh, and indeed we conducted a survey last year uh, which included CNI and although sustainability is still a key driver of their decision to enter these PPAs two-thirds of respondents cited the need for protection from volatile prices and also long-term price certainty. And but more recently, we can see that trend continuing into Q1 2023, where of the 68 deals that have been announced, 42 have been done by corporates. I mean, that's like 62%. In terms of where we go from here, what we are seeing as you may know, people in this room will know, gas prices, power prices are coming down. If you look at the German uh, futures market, the front year contract is starting to flatten out a bit. The Dutch TTF hub has dropped as well. And all that has a bearing on PPA appetite. So what we're seeing now, we're seeing the traditional utility off-takers return to market and offer some uh, long-term uh, PPAs. In terms of the context of 247, as has been mentioned a couple of times already, there's a role here for innovative PPA structures, novel structures, because you know, your annually matched PPAs will come to later, it doesn't quite cut the mustard. So there's scope here for PPAs such as hybrid PPAs, where you'll co-locate storage 
with renewable asset, that then allows the seller to sell a particular profile to the client rather than just a page produced. That's not just theoretical. There was most recent uh, deal caused by Axpo and another seller in the German market. We've also supported similar deals in the GB market, which is quite hot for the co-located uh, opportunity. And it's been my experience over 16 years in this industry that one thing that marks us as a truly remarkable business to be in is in an industry that historically was not accustomed to change. It was quite a boring, dull industry. I came from the tech sector to this and I thought, what the hell have I done? <laughs> but the level of change and the pace of change and the level of innovation and ingenuity, and that's right across the value chain from the LCOE reductions from offshore wind and the key technologies, but also the level of innovation in the tech, the data, because utilities frankly suck at data, <laughs> they're getting better, and we're now becoming a more data-driven industry. And how an industry such as ours have responded to that gives me tremendous hope for the future. And indeed, within Pixar Park, that is our reason for being. We help innovate, we help drive these structures, we help inform with PPA data, with the tools and the systems to help clients on their PPA journey. And I see as the next evolution for that is the 247 corporate procurement, which is the new frontier, but also a key enabler to Europe's green hydrogen production ambition. But more commercially, there's an opportunity here for Pexa Park to leverage its skills to, to better serve that growing need. Perfect. And I like the way you've converted your what the hell am I doing into an exciting, challenging opportunity for you. For you. Hedging is one thing I mentioned. You touched on it there. I mean, can you dive into some real detail specifics about the hedging, potential hedging benefits of hourly matching, but also the, you know, however, but, you know, what are yeah. the conditions that need to be in place? Of course, uh, I think the only challenge here is I may go into full geek mode and overrun my time. That's so okay. just I'll give you one minute of geek. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there is a strong desire within corporates, as evidenced by the level of activity, to inure or protect themselves from wholesale market volatility and get long term price certainty. And traditional annual match PPAs, they certainly do that. But the caveat being, as Bruce showed earlier, they only do that for as long as the volumes delivered under that PPA match the profile. And more often than not, that production profile is not going to match your consumption profile, therefore leaving the corporates with a residual risk to the wholesale market. Conversely, 247 gives you that price certainty and shields you from volatility every hour of every day. There's a but, and there's always a but. The but is, in order to get to those very high levels of matching, requires, based on existing technologies, and we'll come on to this in a moment, really requires a level of overhedging that creates its own exposure. So rather than being short, you'll be periods where you're long, and that then has to be managed. So the real key to this lies in the design of the portfolio and how you construct our portfolio. So for example, there's numerous studies done that show if you layer solar with wind as an offset, but if you layer solar wind with storage, that allows some more. Because the, the key thing here is trying to align or trying to achieve the highest level of matching, but at the least amount of excess volume. And there are things that will be optimal for some clients and not optimal for the other. There's things that will shift the needle, including long duration storage, including you know, demand side measures also. But ultimately, there's things that can be done now, and it goes back to those aforementioned examples of that kind of PPA innovation and structuring, Chris. Yeah, very good. Okay, we're gonna come for some questions to the audience. Um, there is a microphone, so just put your hands up. But while you, you do that, I mean, what you just described there about that collective solution is exactly the reason we're, we're now setting up this Global Renewables Alliance. So wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, long duration storage and green hydrogen working together for stakeholders. That's corporate off-takers, but also policymakers who now want that collective solution. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, please, there's one in the front here, and there's one in the middle. Please, do just state your name and your organization, and then... Uh, um, <coughs> hello, Vadim Mutkin from uh, DTEC Ukraine Energy Storage Lead. I have a question, of course, regarding the energy storage and uh, long duration. So, we are in the lithium battery world, right? So, we are mostly piggybacking on the automotive industry, right? So, it's uh, good and bad, of course, right? But the good that 
Uh, we enjoy the radical price decline. Don't talk about 2022, it's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of outlier. Um, for the long duration energy storage, you don't have, or we don't have this privilege, right? So nobody used the, uh, you know, the tanks of electrolyte in electric vehicles. So uh, the sodium ion battery are coming to the, play, uh, to the uh, scene, right? So with the $50 per kilowatt hour. So how are you going to compete with this uh, relatively new and unproven technology? Uh, well, to some extent, right? So uh, with the marching of the lithium ion and the uh, huge, huge demand from the uh, from automotive sector. Thank you. It's, it's great to meet you, and, and that's going to take me a long time to de 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 deconstruct the question <laughs> for hours. But to get to the two points I heard, one on competitive markets and balancing innovation with the existing technologies of long durationary storage. I think one is that the diversity of long duration energy storage is critical. We're building on a lot of the experience of pumped hydro, compressed air, liquid air, the decades of experience, and weaving into that the innovation of a lot of new technologies and electrochemicals. I like to joke that LDES, sodium, lithium, um, iron, vanadium, the whole periodic table other than lithium ion is long duration energy storage. What's fantastic about this market is that we now have the tools, like the 24-7 clean PPA, working some of those examples you saw earlier are LDES. <laughs> We're already in the marketplace. We just need to expand and scale up. There are places around the world where LDES has been in the market for you know, a flow battery for over five years. Um, we have proof. It's just sharing this knowledge. And I think it's really showing the benefits of, and the cost savings. You pointed out that $50 megawatt hour, many of the LDES technologies are doing that today and will continue to do that as we use 24-7 to bring the cost down. Bruce also showed a slide of, you know, it's going to be 100% at the beginning. You kind of have that, that, that hurt point of this is how much we have to pay. But if you put the, the scenario out there and start to de-risk together, those costs come down just as fast as solar did and even faster. So we're in a new economy. We have a lot more actors and a ton more need for long duration storage, and we have to have tools like the 24-7 Clean PPA to help us get there. So, and I look forward to talking with you more afterwards. Thank you. There's another question in the middle here. There's a microphone just coming. Thank you. Uh, Dara Linus, uh, the Electricity Association Ireland. I just wanted to know how important is the proximity of the renewables portfolio in the 24-7 matching? So location. To avoid, obviously, yeah. the accusation that if it is a thousand miles away, that it's just traditional offsetting. Great question. Who wants to take that? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take that. So what we have been working to is local grid. So the, the, the local grid within the country, not necessarily at nodal level, but within the country. So for example, in, in, in Ireland, we've got a single electricity market in the Republic in Northern Ireland, two jurisdictions. We've been working on a policy that we would only use uh, green credentials from our Republic of Ireland assets for a, a Republic of Ireland customer and our Northern Irish assets for a Northern Irish customer. And if I could just build on that, what we're seeing is that Ireland's 30 gigawatts of offshore wind is quite impressive. And we, long duration storage wants to make sure that's successful and, and on the grid 24 seven. There are other companies that have territory around the world. And so it, they can have different projects and, and different accountability. I think the key to the 24 seven is the granularity and the transparency, because there are gonna be different geographies, different matching, but you've gotta have this tool in place so that you can actually track the different types of LDES with wind and solar. But I think there's possibilities, just depends. Yeah, right, I mean, as, as I showed, you know, the time is important, location is critical as well. So it's decarbonizing the local grid. There's a debate now going on, you know, about emissionality and, and, and hourly. And um, I mean, we clearly see the benefits of hourly are being proved in, in real time by organizations like Google, but also by the modeling that's being done. So those independent models show that the decarbonization rates can be accelerated using hourly. Uh, and as you say, instead of uh, offsetting. Um, in terms of the different jurisdictions as well, you mentioned you know, the, the granularity and the matching. I mean, Taiwan is one, one great example of where they just leapfrogged what we're doing in, in for example, in Europe with our guarantees of origin. They are time stamp uh, certificates are actually 15 minute. So, and when we asked them, well, why would you do that? They'd say, well, why would we do what you're doing? You know, we're, we're future proofing. 
So, you know, they, they, that's, that's what we're going to take to the new markets is, is exactly that. One other example I'll give you, which is, I, mean, I think is one of the most significant announcements we've seen, and it went a bit under the radar, is Tata Steel last week announced a deal to source 960 megawatts of hybrid wind and solar round the clock. Yeah. And so that's not only Global South, it's not only a huge deal, but it's also an energy intensive. That's massively significant. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that. We know there's discussions going on. And I think that's, uh, that's where the future lies. Yeah, please. Yeah, just building on that, uh, Tata. So we, we were quite a bit and a very innovative company. Uh, an example of 24-7 uh, used by Tata in Mumbai is secondary market PPAs. So when, when you buy your PPAs, they don't have an adequate, in India, a wholesale market where they can trade their uh, ups or downs. So what they, what, they, what they are trying is a secondary market where uh, we create, we first track and trace, and then the second thing is whatever, like hour by hour, 15 minute by 15 minute, whatever is my uh, excess or my shortfall, I sell it to another buyer who's there, available there to buy it. And, and that, to Taiwanese example is we, we were uh, just asking why, why are you doing it and then the same thing like why would we do what everybody has done and fail it we want to leapfrog and get to the next level. Mm. Yeah so leapfrog in terms of certification business models technologies that's all all on the table now. Irina, yeah any comment about the especially new markets maybe. You, you yeah I just wanted to mention also a good example from India that we are currently working on because we see that they really want leap to leapfrog and we had a good session with them at COP27 as well to showcase the progress that they are doing. Um, this company, Greenco, is really uh, doing quite a lot on 24-7. They have amazing solutions also when it comes to storage as well. They're providing electricity on 15 uh, Indian states and they are definitely doing uh, time match procurement, hourly matching. And indeed, they were trying to explain to the audience at the COP that they can also have much more granularity if they want and they're just using hourly matching because now it's the common standard, but they can also do it 15 minutes. So there are very good examples emerging now from India. It's a very interesting country to work with. So we're going to come to another poll. Yeah, so if we could have the slider up, if you grab your phones again. This is a question about hedging. Yeah, we touched on that before. Um, and let's see what the audience think of the question on the screen. You may have it on your phones before it comes on the screen. Uh, I think I've surprised the AV. <laughs> Whilst we're waiting, why don't we give a huge round of applause to the audiovisual team uh, who've supported us. <laughs> but seriously, Stefan, Julie, DDMC, world-class operations as well, seamless. Thank you so much. Really appreciated. There you go. So, a simple true or false or don't know. Do you think 24-7 carbon-free PPAs offer better hedging against volatile power prices? True, false, I don't know. Over to you. Is there anybody on, on the panel who thinks that's false, that they don't? <laughs> yeah. Okay. When you're ready, we'll show those. And also, we're going to come for some more questions to the audience. Um, don't know. You see, I think that's a good answer. I mean, I would say as well, I wouldn't say don't know, but I would say it depends. I think that goes to the nuance that John mentioned about that, but it all depends how you structure it your portfolio, and so on. And that's the exciting opportunity here around business models, technologies, portfolio, MISC, and players. We're going to come now to uh, a couple of questions on market design. So I'm going to, Caroline, I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. But, you know, in Europe now, we have, um, let's say, a challenge, energy crisis, an opportunity with the reform, potential reform of this market design in Europe. But also, we're seeing that being discussed in other jurisdictions around the world. What's, what's your view on the market design? And I'm talking specifically in the context of hourly matching. What are the opportunities for long-term contracting, PPAs, CFDs, those topics that could potentially influence the direction of travel? 
Yeah. Um, well, so I think at a high level, I'm encouraged um, by what's going on in Europe and EMD and just endorsing that PPAs are a tool that we need. You know, you have sort of several buckets of capital here, but that private investment capital is one that I don't think has been harnessed enough yet and driven to its full potential. So just the fact that we recognize now that PPAs are a clear value add and a critical tool is the first step. I've also been really encouraged to see that we're going beyond just the traditional PPA, right? We're recognizing that if we have a, a more time matched PPA, um, that can drive greater value, not only to the off taker, but to the system in general. And I think it's leveraging that private investment towards whatever the procurement goal is and having that drive, you know, a greater impact is, is really what this is all about. You know, and we always say if, if Google meets 24 seven and, and no one else does, we've failed. But that's because ultimately the goal is that whatever our private investment is drives greater impact for our neighbors, you know, right and left of us. Um, and I think there's also there's the opportunity shaping up to really create those best practices now. You know, and, and the U.S. is in a similar place, but I think it's going to happen here first. And I think whatever we create here in terms of hourly um, location-based PPA procurement and, and really matching that as, as an important hedge, um, that's going to set off a lot of private investment. And I think that unlocking that right now is going to be critical, not only for what we see in the energy crisis, but also just aligning all the actors towards the infrastructure that we need. So market design is critical. It's what I spent way too many years studying in grad school. But um, it, what's shaping up right now is really, really encouraging. Yeah, it is encouraging. And, and I've discovered over my few years that uh, your electric market design is not only uh, interesting, it's super important as it's well. It's super important. Those rules are important, yeah. Um, just yesterday, I believe, there was uh, an amendment, maybe a few days ago, an amendment from Renew um, on that topic, sort of favoring uh, hourly matching as well. So we'll see how that develops in Europe. Long way to go in the discussions, but as you say, it seems to be heading in the right direction. I'm going to turn to, to hydrogen, maybe the elephant in the room, maybe not talked about much in the electricity sector, but you know, there is a role for hydrogen. Um, what does anybody, anybody in the panel dare touch on hydrogen? I mentioned the Delegated Act in Europe, which is certainly heading in the right direction, setting you know, good, strict rules, criteria for renewable hydrogen. Uh, any comments on what the role could be for 24-7 in the future? Hydrogen is a key component of this, and hydrogen is also long duration energy storage. I think we need to make sure that we're doing these parallel pathways that we talked about to say hydrogen's a goal here in 10, 15 years. Here's long duration energy storage technologies here today, the next five. And then the market really needs to have the flexibility to make sure we're supporting these diverse technologies. We can't pick and choose. We really need to make sure we're changing the entire economy so we have to support all these different mechanisms. Okay, thanks. We're going to come for one round of questions in the audience. He oh. has something to say. Oh, sorry. Sorry, John. I didn't see you there. No, please go ahead. Oh, thank you, Bruce, for an extra moment to speak. The only thing I would really add uh, to the Delegated Act, it's a significant piece of legislation, in my opinion, not just for green H2 production in Europe, but also it's the first piece of legislation to really formalize and define that X factor of additionality. So it's not just a 247, it's very clear on location, because from my experience dealing even with a cross section of RE100, you'll get some companies that it has to be the same price zone, and the same they will not do cross-border. Others are more sanguine about cross-border, and there's always open to interpretation. So I think it's inevitable in many respects that the Delegated Act and how it defines additionality is going to impact, and I would hope that we'd come to a harmonization on a viewpoint of what additionality is. The other aspect of this is, of course, the elephant in the room would be how many PPAs are going to be available, because obviously there's a finite amount of renewable energy there, renewable projects, so it's going to be really stiff competition from traditional renewable off-takers, corporates, corporates that want to do 247, and those green hydrogen guys. So the market's really, really going to heat up over these coming years. So it's quite exciting times. Very exciting. One last 
short comment, Irina, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Very, very short comment, just building up uh, to what you were saying about green hydrogen. It's becoming a really hot topic, and a lot of signatories were interested in discussing this and what's happening in North America, so additionality, the three pillars. We had a workshop together with colleagues from Energy Tag and Princeton University to discuss all the complicated issues around hydrogen, but definitely will be very important going forward and linking it much more with uh, hourly matching. Thanks a lot. We're, we're out of time. We're going to do one word from each of the panelists to wrap up. And I want to know what's next. Next five years, what's needed to really accelerate hourly matching? Starting with you, Caroline. What's needed? Um, everything we've talked about today is needed. I think the one thing that we haven't talked about really here is how do we create the space for these non-traditional investors to get involved. You know, I sit up here, Microsoft sits up here, big global buyers with large sustainability goals sit up here, but the, the key to moving this forward is getting those very traditional bread and butter industrial players engaged on this because that's the type of capital that's going to drive change. And so my hope is in five years, I'm not sitting up here. And that frankly, it's five different steel suppliers or car manufacturers or paper manufacturers because they've seen the value of this for economic development. They've seen how it makes them competitive in the field and they've committed to it, not only because it's a you know novel sustainability goal, but because it's going to make them a better business. Yeah, it would be a shame not to have you on the stage. I know, I'm great, uh, but whatever. It'd be awesome not to be here. <laughs> but, uh, but that would be the signal of success if, if that comes true. Fergal. Just keep it short, please. A couple of words on yep. what's next. Well, ho whole system thinking. So bringing in CFE procurement, distributed energy resources behind the meter, private wire, system flexibility or demand flexibility. But most importantly, energy efficiency it has to be a key mm -hmm. pillar to everything as we decarbonize transport and heat. Yeah, absolutely. Julia? International governing body to hold the groups accountable to bring in all the players, giving that transparent data and accountability, and making sure that long duration energy storage and the four families are identified in the criteria to make to get the, the success we need. International governing body, that's a task for the GRA, is that what you're saying? Yeah. I think she yes, practiced more to that do. One. <laughs> yeah. John. Yep, well, to quote another RE 100 member, just do it. Uh, many of the ingredients to start the 247 journey already exist. But unless there's demand from corporates, not just the hydrogen producers, there won't be that level of innovation. We have seen it in small pockets, but you could do so much more. So start that journey now. Thanks, Vivek. Bring supportive regulation. Uh, there are hundreds, but there are other millions and billions who are not doing it. And without just regulation, voluntarily, it may not get over that hump. So bring appropriate regulation to facilitate this. That is what is needed. Very good. And finally, Irina. And for me, will be to have the right um, framework and enabling policy and uh, legislative environment also for prosumers, for citizens, not only in Europe and North America, but all around the world to really play a meaningful role on 24 7 on the demands and on, on storage as well. So that will be very good to see. So, to conclude, huge opportunities, some challenges, but it will bring massive benefits. Uh, it's now inevitable. Just do it. Was that it? Yeah. Huge thank you to the panelists. Apologies for going slightly over. <laughs> after, the, after the closing speech, yeah, to close the conference, we're going to be by the, fo the photo wall outside holding Go Carbon Free CFE. Anybody who's passionate about it, join us there. We're going to do a group photo. Thank you very much.